Progress and no finer name could have been found for the pride of Victoria's Railway as the magnificent express train stands ready for her inaugural run. All steel steamed in the most. In 1937, the Victorian Railways launched what would become one of Australia's most famous trains, the Spirit of Progress, a fast luxury express built with no expense or effort spared. The spirit of progress does the 190 mile journey in 230 minutes. A big improvement, and so is this, a stewardess for the ladies. Here's the regular 6.30 p.m. departure from Melbourne. The bell goes and the crowd responds with a chorus of, don't forget to write. With a resounding blast from the sire and the proud driver eases open the throttle, the fireman feeds another meal to the voracious furnace, and the wonder train glides out of the station with green signals clearing the way for its non-stop run to Albury. Many a Underneath its streamlined steel, the Spirit was still a steam train, but the futuristic design was significant. The train was first and foremost a public relations exercise, part of a bid by railways to win back passengers they had already begun to lose. After nearly a century of supremacy, railways were about to face challenges that would bring them to the brink of economic disaster. Railways in the 1990s are facing the future with more sense of direction than they have shown for 50 years. It's been a slow fight back after decades of decline. Passenger trains are still part of the railway scene, but they no longer pay the bills. Luxury travel trains like the Outback Garn still serve as railway flagships, but even this popular train loses money. Aircraft are the first choice for anyone who wants to get somewhere fast. Airlines have also stolen some railway freight traffic. Road transport gives the railways even tougher competition. Back in 1937, these challenges were not yet facts of life, but competition was already starting to bite. The spirit of progress was born directly out of the railway's concern for the future. From the offices of the Victorian Railways Commissioners goes the order, Victoria must have the finest train in the Southern Hemisphere. And a thousand machines start to beat out their message of greater speed, greater comfort and greater safety. Forges, lathes, huge presses and a score of other intricate machines leap to life and begin to play a symphony of steel as news of the new era runs like wildfire through the huge plant at Newport Railway Workshops. Technicians representing over 60 different trades go to work with a will. The pressure goes on and little by little, from a drawing on a draftsman's sketchboard is born a gleaming monster of the rails, spirit of progress. For generations, Trains had been the only way anyone who was anyone travelled anywhere. With their ultra-modern spirit, the Victorian Railways hoped to keep the age of luxury passenger travel alive. To emphasise the train's speed and power, a race with an aeroplane was even staged. It was a clever publicity stunt. They're driving her along smoothly and effortlessly at an Australian speed record of 84 miles per hour. And even the plane from which the camera films the thrilling sight has to find a soft air to keep up with her. The spirit was a bold gesture. But there was no escaping the fact that the age of total railway supremacy was coming to an end. In fact, trains didn't feel the full impact of competition straight away, but only because World War II intervened. A combination of petrol rationing and a shortage of motor vehicles 
kept trains in peak demand. The war exacted a toll in other ways. Locomotives had been overworked. Nothing had been replaced. Servicing and maintenance consumed even more time. If the future was uncertain, so was the reliability of antique rolling stock. Much of it belonged in a museum. Thirlmere Railway Museum near Sydney preserves some of the best of Australia's railway heritage. But the real point is that most of these exhibits were museum pieces long before they retired. It wasn't uncommon for steam locomotives and rolling stock to serve for 80 years. Ian McFarlane has followed Australia's post-war railway story as both an enthusiast and a professional engineer. As he sees it, the railway's problems went much deeper than outdated rolling stock. I guess the problem was that the whole country was starting to think nationally, except for the railways. The railways were still six separate state organisations, independent, bureaucratic and increasingly subject to political interference and union interference as well and they were not run as businesses but the trucking industry was it was a powerful business and a very successful one so if you're a businessman shipping interstate you had to deal with two sometimes three separate bureaucratic organizations but you didn't have to do that if you were dealing with a trucking company or even a shipping line It was no wonder that many of rail's traditional customers started to look elsewhere. And as Ian explains, they didn't have to look far. Now from the 1920s onwards, the state governments regulated all transport in their states very tightly. And they charged high road taxes on all trucking operations, primarily to subsidize their railway businesses that they had. And the truckies cried foul over this for many, many years. Finally, in 1954, they launched a landmark court case which was carried through the State Courts, the High Court of Australia and up to the Privy Council, challenging the right of a state government to levy tax, road tax, on interstate road transport. And the truckies won. That decision laid the foundation for Australia's long-haul trucking industry as it is today acknowledged as one of the most efficient in the world. Railways simply couldn't afford to lose their freight business. It was their lifeblood. In an attempt to stem the losses, a major re-equipment program began in 1951. Conversion from steam to diesel power. Conversion to diesels finally took 25 years. But the mid-1970s saw all states running diesel fleets. Compared to steam, they were more fuel efficient, needed less pit stops and fewer repairs. It was the end of an era. A prosaic workhorse had replaced a chariot of fire. It was an essential change, but not one that every engine driver welcomed. With the steam, with the smoke curling around, and you're going along, and leaning out, and the breeze blowing past you, well, I just can't see anything in the diesel to uh, compare with the steam. The uh, steam, you're 
in control of the horsepower. The man himself is in control of the horsepower. And there's no comparison in the, the two of them. Steam is skill, and skill alone. Whatever drivers thought, it would be left to enthusiasts to keep the age of steam alive. Not even diesels could solve all the railway's problems. Too often the new diesels ran on the same old tracks. The track alignment on major corridors often dates back 70 years. Long, slow curves were designed to ease grades in the age of steam. All they do for today's powerful diesels is slow them down. By the 1970s, rail was also starting to suffer from worse problems than inefficiency. Discouraged by skyrocketing costs and declining trade, some governments had begun to neglect even essential railway works. It was a formula for disaster. John Logan. An overhead road bridge has collapsed on an interurban train in Sydney's western suburbs and as many as 200 people could be trapped. The Public Transport Commission said a short while ago the locomotive and one carriage is on its side and another two carriages are trapped under the wreckage of the bridge. The accident occurred on the... On the 18th of January 1977 at suburban Granville in New South Wales Australia faced its worst ever rail tragedy. Historically, rail's accident record had been good, but in New South Wales at least, Granville climaxed a decade of corner cutting. Safety had been getting steadily worse. Horrific for those involved, the Granville tragedy was equally traumatic for railway authorities. A sudden shock that helped to bring a whole outdated edifice tumbling down. In the 1990s, vital infrastructure improvements are finally underway. Wooden sleepers are being replaced with more durable concrete. Continuous welded rails are being installed. Giant track laying machines like this are relaying thousands of kilometers of mainline track. Lines that can't be maintained are being closed, but those that remain will be faster and safer tracks. 
For more than 50 years, Sydney train users have lived in the dark ages. But now, our steam age stations are being modernised. Bright new paint. As in the 1930s, railways are once again trying to win back passengers with an updated image. To make stations brighter, patch-ups and paint jobs have been ominously frequent over the years. But this time, the changes do seem to go deeper. Take a train for a change. Faced with Australia-wide losses of over two and a half billion dollars a year, the new approach is to try to specialise in what rail does best. At the present time, hauling minerals is what rail does best of all. A modern coal haulage like this is just about the perfect rail operation. Designed to run on an endless loop, the trains themselves are always moving, whether loading at the mine or discharging their cargo at port. Coal and other minerals make up half of the railway's total traffic, and they're often the only freight that shows a profit, underwriting losses on nearly every other Australian train. Rail is still an effective mover of many other heavy freights. The general rule being, the heavier the better. Container freight is also expanding. On long hauls like the Transcontinental, trains still give trucks a run for their money, holding 70% of the total business. Trains are also learning to shake hands with trucks. The road railer is a valuable innovation. It's a system that literally converts a semi-trailer payload into a railway wagon, then back again at the end of the line. In the case of passenger trains, the greatest change is being felt in the bush. For instance, in New South Wales, passenger trains once stopped at over a thousand stations. In the future, the modern XPT will serve just 40 centres. Many country passengers will complete their journeys by bus. The decision to cut back country trains hasn't been popular, but the real question is whether Australia can afford to keep running trains that few travellers actually use. Faye Powell, New South Wales Country Link Manager, doesn't think so. I think you've got to make your product relevant again to the marketplace. We've seen in the last uh, five to ten years a, a deregulation in the market. Coach travel and uh, the state of the roads has improved dramatically and most people in making their travel choice uh, didn't think rail first. They saw modern equipment uh, in other transport systems, air and coach, and uh, saw very old dilapidated equipment on rail. We know from research that the, the reasons people uh, choose their travel mode is journey time, uh, frequency, reliability and of course price. And uh, in all of those areas, if you compared us with our competition, we came last. Uh, we now have a product in the XPTs that's certainly faster than our road-based competition. Uh, the fares are competitive with that uh, form of travel and uh, of course with modern equipment like this we're highly reliable. Reliable and modern though it is, the introduction of the XPT on the North Coast Line actually brought storms of protest. 
Quite naturally, uh, the people who were using the train reacted violently against the removal of the train. Uh, but we've got to remember that those people were, in the main, 80% of them weren't paying full fare to travel on the train and they were getting the sort of facilities, dining cars, sleeping berths, for less than the cost of coach travel. So naturally it was the, uh, the travel bargain of the century and uh, they hate to uh, see that lost. Much more than in the past, railway policy is being based on hard-headed economics. But according to railway estimates, even with fewer and newer trains, country passenger services can never pay their way. The future of urban trains seems fairly safe, although none of these trains show a profit either. Urban rail, in fact, creates a massive 80% of the railway's losses. Nearly half the passengers travel on some kind of concession, but at least governments now tend to count that cost as a social benefit, not as a railway debt. Concessions aside, Full fare passengers also pay only a third of the real cost of their trip. By world standards, Australia's rail fares are very cheap. Commuter trains do at least ease some of the pressure on city roads, although not as much as most people think. Railways carry less than 5% of the urban transport load. It's ironic, though, that just when railways are looking harder than ever at their bottom line, the community is starting to take a broader view. Trains are eight times more fuel efficient than trucks. They cause less pollution. Every million tonnes of freight trains carry means 50,000 fewer trips by truck. More rail passengers means less pressure on the roads. For the first time in decades, perhaps encouraged by changing community values, there are new railway schemes on the drawing boards. It will mean tunnelling. Ideally, a tunnel would go straight to the airport, but this would mean great cost. One New South Wales proposal is to link the airport with the city. The initiative is most striking of all in illustrating how out of touch railways became. Fifty years after air travel came of age, this line, if built, will be Australia's first direct airport to city link. It can be, and it will be. All we need now is the right idea and right people with the will to carry it through. Already, a newly formed National Freight Corporation is working to overcome the old interstate divisions, finally bringing Australia's major freight links under one central control. But the task isn't easy. Public railways continue to be run by six different governments. They continue to run on different gauges and with different degrees of commercial success. Yet, despite their losses, most state governments still tend to guard their railway borders as jealously as ever. In view of the past, perhaps it's not surprising that Australia's most visionary railway scheme is being proposed by a private consortium. Designed to supersede existing rail passenger links between Sydney and Melbourne, the service will replace the present four trains a day with 35. Competing directly with road and air, they'll travel at something close to aircraft speeds. Known as the VFT, 
the very fast train, the scheme is similar to this French design. This train, the TGV Atlantic, runs every day between Paris and the west coast of France at 300 kilometers per hour. In March 1990, it exceeded 515, that's 320 miles an hour, a world record, naturally. To most Australians, the VFT project seems almost wildly ambitious. Yet Japan has been running similar trains for over 25 years. The French trains too have already completed a decade of impressive commercial success. In Europe, Asia and North America, trains like this will soon be commonplace. In Australia, public acceptance still has to be won, which could mean the revival of a familiar publicity stunt. Australia may not need some of the trains it has, yet the country may still not have the trains it really needs. But railway success in the future will depend most of all on a willingness to adopt a genuinely national approach, to make a spirit of progress a description of railway cooperation, not just the name of the train. <laughs>